Hello, I'm Terry David Mulligan. This is the Mulligan Stew Podcast. Kyle Ward is shooting this. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Ron Saxmith is our guest. Um, his 17th album is called The Vivian Line, which is a rural road that takes you from Toronto to uh, Stratford, Ontario, which is what he did. That's what happened. They got out of Toronto, uh, he and his beloved, and they headed for Stratford. But his music didn't really change, but the, it really, I think it did get better. You, you check it out, the Vivian line. Um, there is one song that was written years ago called uh, Diamond Wave. It may be the best song in the album. How it didn't get released previously is beyond me. And then we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about his life in general, how he got to write these songs, and, and who is, I want to ask him about who is Ron Sexsmith and who are the fans who like him so much that he travels the world and people love him and then you talk to the person beside them and they've never heard of him. How is that possible? We're going to talk about those things and more on the Mulligan Stew video podcast on YouTube. Enjoy. Details at mulliganstew.ca. Thank you, Kyle Ward. Give me that thing. I want to say this is Kyle Ward. Okay, well, this is uh, this is the Mulligan Stew podcast, and this is Mulligan Stew in the CKUA Radio Network, and it's the Terry David Mulligan YouTube channel. And uh, I just went in there to have a look. I this stuff posted in there. I I can't even remember doing. Um, <laughs> how is that possible? Um, uh, I have the one and only Ron Sexsmith on the line. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. I, I, but I follow you religiously. I find when you post, I see those posts come up, mm-hmm. and uh, we're going to talk about the Vivian line, if that's okay with you. And I know you, you you're getting ready to to hit the road. Um, I didn't tell you, by the way this this is running Easter weekend, so you're put your Easter thinking cap on. Okay, you're all right. Okay, um, I know you're heading out in the road, and and then you'll sort of we'll be able to follow you there'll be posts and you'll you'll do some stuff and people will re- re- review the concerts and you and it's a the, the continuation of a life you used to have yeah i mean uh we i toured a little bit last year and got my toe wet um but th- but these uh but this tour especially the american tour i haven't played there since 2015 and it's kind of the most shows i've played in a, a since before the pandemic so um you know, I went into it with a lot of kind of trepidation because I don't really do well in America. You know, I do much better in the, you know in the UK and these places, but but the east side of uh, the eastern states, we did quite well. I was pleasantly surprised. So I'm hoping I'll do okay on the west. Do you have any theories on that? As you well know, uh, lots of there's been lots of heroes of ours, the yeah. tragically hip for one, blue rodeo for another. Uh, who have small pockets of fans in America, but not overall. What's the, what do you think, uh, it, other than a hit, yeah. is the breakthrough in the U.S.? What do you have to do? Well, I think in my case, when I came out, I mean, I got signed to a U.S. label, right? I was signed to Interscope. Yeah. And people in Canada, did, I don't even think they even knew where I was from originally, you know. And um, But I think for me, in my case, I didn't have the look or the sound. I mean, I came out at a time when... You know, it was Eddie Vedder and all that, and I didn't have that sound, that grungy sort of thing. And I just didn't know how... And also, I think I sing better now than I did when I came out. So oh. maybe if I'd sung a little better, maybe I would have had a little more luck. But Amer- America's a tough nut to crack because there's so there's so many little, like you say, pockets, you know? And I mean, you could be a, a huge country artist down in America that nobody knows you in New York City or something like that, you know? So it's kind of... Uh, you know, but I'm lucky that I also have, I have like a cult following, basically, you know, like I, I sold out Minneapolis and we sold out New York and Georgia and this and that. So I do, I have, there's about six or seven or eight cities where I think I do, you know, I and mean, I don't mean I'm playing huge places, but I, I mean, you know, where there's interest for me, um, which is kind of the true of Canada too. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't do that great here either, Really? 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 You know, I mean, in, in Toronto, I could play maybe Massey Hall every now and then or something, sure. or a major city. But but most of the time, I'm playing small theaters or, or clubs still. So you here's know. the th- here's the thing, because you don't get, go around saying, "Hey, I'm I'm Ron Sexsmith." I go around and say or play Ron Sexsmith. Listen up, and people yeah. pay attention. They really do. Yeah. And 
and they know you. They know your story, which is quite remarkable. You're not mm -hmm. just a name on a marquee. Um, uh, you, you, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but um, uh, <laughs> I keep seeing on press releases, I keep seeing the word beloved. Uh, yeah. And I'm not buying beloved. I'm not buying any of that stuff. You have to earn beloved. Yeah. And I believe I mean, this is your 17th <laughs> album. Is that correct? It's Yeah, you're correct. Uh, so you yeah, earned you're, the beloved. Well, thank you for saying that. I don't know. I mean, I, I think maybe in certain circles, um, uh, I'd like to think that I've been around long enough that I'm sort of relatively established here, you know, at least, mm -hmm. you know, they know, uh, I don't know. I mean, they know my name and so, some records have done better than others. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, it's weird because I'll sometimes I'll see Jim Cuddy or something and they're huge in Canada, but yep. not really anywhere else. Right. Yep. And and I could, can get jealous sometimes of that, that I don't do as well in Canada. And I think he can sometimes get a little envious that they can't go to the UK like I can and play for, you know, you know, so it's it's like a grass is greener kind of situation. But Ron, you know, it's showbiz. Yeah. They bring a show. They bring you are but a, a balladeer born yeah. in the lamps, right? They yeah. bring a sh show, the whole, and they, everybody, they all have their own solo albums that can, they can pull in. It's an event, and that's what you need. And I, what I don't understand is why it doesn't translate to the to the States. But let me let me ask you a two-part question. Yeah. Wow, oh, I knew this was going to be fun. Um, here's the deal. Um, did you watch the Grammys? Yeah, I, I got to say, we were flicking channels. So every now and then we'd land on the Grammys and then we'd, you know, we'd watch something. I, you know, I did, saw some of the Grammys. Did you see any of Bonnie's win? Oh, my God. Yeah, I love okay. that. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So all of that show, all of that lipstick and feather and explosions and gender and whatever. Yeah. It was Bonnie with a guitar. Yeah. Singing a Brothers Landreth song. And, and and releasing an album, winning three Grammys. That was the big cheer for me. That gave me heart and hope. And here's the second part of the question. I did the Juno couch at CKUA in, in um, uh, Edmonton. And we had friends uh, sitting on the couch. And, and, and Cuddy was supposed to be there when he was playing hockey. But I got Tom Wilson. Yeah. And I got uh, uh, Dan Mangan. Oh, yeah, Dan Mangan, yes. co-host with me, right? And, okay. and we had Digging Roots, and we had all sorts of people show up. We had uh, Mark Jordan and Amy Scott. And, um, uh, but when I saw that show, the, actually Juno's show, mm -hmm. I, I, that, that wasn't for me. Yeah, you know. And there's two Junos. There's the Junos you're not going to see because they mm -hmm. get the awards out before, and then there's the show. Right. So what do you make of that? You know, that's... You know, one time, the, the, one time I saw Tom Power interview a guy named Daniel Caesar. You know, who's like an R and B artist, or yeah. I, I think I, that's how he would, cause, you know. And and I remember Tom asked him, "What's your favorite Juno memory?" And he said, "Well, I've actually never seen the Junos before." And but, but I, you know, I, I had this revelation: like, why would he have watched the Junos? Yeah. You know, because he never would have seen himself oh. in that equation. You know. And because sometimes I was starting to feel sad that I watched the Junos and I don't see myself in that equation in, anymore. But for the longest time, it, it was, you know what I mean? It was like Lightfoot and all these people that that sure. kind of music, that kind of music makes sense to me. But I'm a I'm a almost 60 year old white guy from Canada, you know, and it never occurred to me before that there were people that felt excluded. And, and it probably should have occurred to me. But, but that was like a real lightning rod moment. And so now when I see the Junos, and you're right, I think that it's not for me, that kind of music. I don't relate to it. And and it's it's things, times, you know, it's it's a different, you know, we're in a different time period now, a different, there's been a cultural shift. And, and I'm not, I feel... A, you know, I think many of us feel a little bit left behind, and that's maybe as it should be. I mean, you know, would you won't see. Would know. that be would be yeah. feeling outdated and antiquated? Exactly. Yeah, and but I felt like that even when I first came out. I mean, you know, the music I was making in 1995 exactly. was considered old hat, and because yes. you know, I'm just the product like everyone else of the my influences and the music I heard growing up, and and that's what I I try to do and. And um, no, but you're right. I watch the Grammys, and sometimes, you know, you mentioned Bonnie Raitt. Like she, there's someone who 
you know, I mean, it's there's so much talent there at the source. A voice and a guitar. A, a voice, voice and a guitar. guitar. And she doesn't need to have these sort of, I don't know what you call it. It's almost like Broadway where there's costumes. And Jim I mean, I don't, I don't, that's, it's like watching, I did a tweet about it actually, because sometimes I watch uh, Saturday Night Live and I don't know who any of the musical artists are. Again, I'm old. And then I, I don't know what they're doing because I used to enjoy watch, I like seeing people play live. And and I, when I was a kid, I'd watch Saturday Night Live and I'd see Ry Cooter or I'd see, you know, the Kinks or something. And that was exciting to me. But but again, it, uh, I'm an old guy and I don't really, uh, I don't, uh, I, it's probably only natural that a lot of this stuff w would sort of go over my head, you know, and uh, and it's probably as it should be, I guess. I, I just have a dream that there, there should be the Junos and then there should be the other Junos. You know, and like Coke, like, like Coke, <laughs> like have Coke and classic Coke, you know. Exactly. And <laughs> I, I'd like to help produce that. I'd like because I, I like all of you all. Yeah, I did. A, I went on a rant after the Juno couch and said, Where, where's uh, Ron Sexsmith? Where's uh, Art Bergman? Uh, where are the, the people that, yeah. that, that sometimes get in between these genres and make great music and we find them? Where are they represented here? But then then I realized I stopped myself and said, well, because maybe they didn't put out a, a release in the qualifying well, year. Well, well, you know, I, I've had three albums out since the last time. I was nominated, so I, it, it, it's very possible that my days of being nominated are just, you know, are past. Why don't you, why don't you just give up? I should just give up. You know, I mean, it's it's silly because none of us do these. None of us make music. At least none, no one I do know I know makes music to four awards, right? It's it's nice to get one. It's nice to be invited to the party or to the ball. And I had there was a whole period of time where I was going to the Junos. Sorry, my chair squeaking almost every year. Uh, or every other year, and I, you know, I've I've won three, and I've been nominated, I think, fifteen times. So I really have nothing to complain about. But but yeah, it's you still get a little sad if you've put an album out and you know it just doesn't get any sort of notice. Okay, but, um, so, uh, let me stop you there. Ron. Hold on a second, because yeah. it plays right into this quote at the bottom of the page. It says, I think it's from um, American Songwriter, uh, mm -hmm. the magazine, uh, or the or the uh, the website. Um, he makes masterpiece music that, that gets played and then fades like mm -hmm. that's unusual. That happens with every artist that goes through very few stay. Yeah. Uh, Pink Floyd. Um, uh, maybe it's the mix of his voice and the music. He's similar to Ray Davies from the Kinks, mm -hmm. uh, Colin Blundstone from the Zombies yeah. and Brian Wilson. I just wasn't made for these times. Um you, I, yeah. I've seen you post your your albums. You always do albums just over your shoulder. I've seen the <laughs> yeah. movies, I've seen the Kinks. I've seen the Zombies. I'm certain I've seen uh, 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 Brian Wilson in the Beach Boys and uh, sure. Sounds. I think it was. Um, so, do they? Did they all? And do they all inform what you do? And as you song, write, and sing? Oh yeah, you know. I mean, as you know, as a kid of the. 60s i was born in 64 and i grew up in early 70s you know it was a very melodic period of music um there was a, i think it was mclean's magazine once did an article about me called melody's child and i i kind of thought that was nice because i do feel like i'm a child of melody and all these people like you mentioned ray davies and brian wilson i just I just sort of soaked it all in, you know, I mean, it was like, it's in my DNA now where yeah, yeah. when I'm writing songs, I'm not thinking about Brian Wilson or anyone or, but obviously I, you know, it's in there, but for me, I think I'm a, I'm kind of like a hybrid between all that stuff, you know, and the British Asian music that I love and all the, the Canadian folkies that I love, sure. like Lightfoot and Leonard and Joni. So somewhere yeah. in the midst of all that is, what I think is is my my sound. You know? well, uh, what's your sound? That's my sound, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we'll get to Leonard in a second. Um, I wrote this question down. Sometimes it translates. Sometimes it doesn't. What albums? Uh, just a couple. Okay. That had a profound effect on you and your music that stay with you now. Oh. Okay, I, I'll just name a couple, but but you know, it, it's one of those questions that you have to kind of readjust every five years or so because there'll be another album that comes along. And, and there's a couple that uh, stay through thick yeah. and thin that have to be there. Yeah. 
I, th I think I'd have to say, um, again, getting back to the kinks, um, I heard the kinks on the radio when I was about 14. It was all day and all the night, on, just on the radio. Of course. And, and, and I never heard it before. And I was like, and it felt like I was hearing it for the first time in 65 or something. So the next day I went to the record store, Sam the Record Man in St. Catharines, and, and I didn't know which one to buy, you know, and I, so I bought this album called Golden Hour of the Kinks. It had like about 25 songs on it. And, and I saw that song all day and all the night was on one side and you really got me. And I said, oh, I know that song too. And I, I knew, I recognized a few of the titles. Sure. Um, but the side one began with a song called Days. That is, you know, if you're a Kinks fan, it's one of those, it wasn't a hit or anything, but it's one of those songs that everyone seems to love by the Kinks. And that changed my life, that hearing that record, you know, because I was already a fan of people like Elton John and the Beatles and stuff. But Ray Davies, for some reason, he was the one that I've made me think that maybe I could write songs. You know, I don't know why. I, I related to him more than I did of Lennon and McCartney. Wow. wow. You know? Because Lennon and McCartney seemed like almost angels. They almost seemed, you know what I mean, almost too cool. And, and McCartney was uber talented. Lennon was just beyond cool. Yeah. And I didn't think I could ever be that cool. But Ray Davies seemed slightly awkward to me. He had, you know, a space between his teeth. He sang a bit flat. And I don't know, I just felt, uh, I don't know, he just made, he brought, he sort of ignited that thing where I want to write songs. So have, you, have you read, or, uh, met Ray Davies? Yeah, you know, um, I've, I've met him, um, I met him as a fan a bunch of times, but then in 2011, I had an album that did very well in the UK called Long Player Late Bloomer, and I was invited to take part in the Meltdown Festival, this annual festival. And every year it's curated by a different artists. Like one year it's David Bowie, or, you know what I mean? And this particular year it was Ray Davies. So he asked me to come. And so when I got to Royal Festival Hall, he was there and we we decided we were going to sing a song together. So we sang this one called Misfits. <laughs> and, um, and then a few days later, I was actually in his recording studio in London. We tried to do a, a, you know, a version of it uh, that's never seen the light of day. Um, and then again, when he played Toronto about a year later, he had me come and sing it again. And that's that's just crazy, you know, because, um, yeah, I just, he's like a god to me in a way, you know. Um, but you got you got a chance to tell him that and you got a chance to work with him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I told him that, but I, I think he was well aware that I was a big fan and, you know. Last yeah. last one off question. I'll get to, I'll get to the titles, I promise. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there a film character that you see yourself as? Oh, wow. One. Okay. Um, yeah, that could be me up there. Maybe the kid from um, Rushmore. <laughs> that movie Rushmore. <laughs> you know, there was, I mean, there's something about that guy that I, that I related to, and I, I don't know exactly what, because he was a lot more industrious than I am, you know. But... Um, I think there was a sort of an outsider feeling I got from watching. I mean, it's one of my favorite movies. And I, I and it's a bit of a cliche, but I think a lot of us who do this for a living felt like that when we were growing up. They felt, you know, like we were, you know, like the song Misfits. <laughs> That's how I felt most of my life. So I still Don't, do that. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Ron Sexsmith. Uh, the new album is The Vivian Line, which yeah. is that road. I've read this now. I think I've done my homework. That's a, a, a road, a through road between Toronto and um, and Stratford. Well, well, close. It's more of like a it's a rural route that runs uh, from Stratford uh, to the it's basically it's a country road that dumps us off on the highway that takes us to Toronto and well, Kitchener and all those places. Yeah. But it's a, it is a connection between you and Toronto. And it's it, a difference between where you are now and where you were. And by the yeah. way, just as an aside. Uh, Chris Waters, the Globe and Mail wine critic, um, sends along his love. Uh, oh, wow. Because uh, you are the pride of St. Catharines. You and he <laughs> are both yeah. St. Catharines. That's right. Uh, so now, that that road, that difference between Toronto, you, and you've told us some of the stories before about how lucky you were to get out of Toronto before COVID and, and find this wonderful spot. And then you had a chance to do a recording studio and, and and do what you do during COVID. 
uh, and it showed itself. But some of these songs, I get the feeling that maybe they've been around for a bit. What's the oldest song? Oh, there is one that's been around. All the other songs are pretty new, but yeah. the one song, Diamond Wave, I wrote in 1988. Why yeah. is that song? It's, yeah. it's maybe the best song on the yeah. album. Why did well, it, why was it run to the litter? Well, it's it, it was like uh, I'd forgotten about it. You know, I mean, I wrote it so long ago. And um, I think I even recorded a version in the 80s that sounds very dated now. It sounds very, very 80s, you know. And what happened was when I was putting these songs together, I just, I was playing it. Something, I was reminded of it. And I didn't even have to go back and, I, it was just came right back to me, the lyrics and everything. And I was just playing it around the house and my wife said, hey, what's that? That sounds pretty good. And I just, uh, and I, so when I went around to demo these new songs, I just stuck it on there to see if my producer would like it. And um, so it's just weird. I just, I forgot about it. And then it's like a lot of things I made, I made, you know, this is my 17th album. So, so generally I was always more excited about the brand new songs. And there was, I think there's other songs that are almost at least as old that never got on an album, you know. So. I, I love that song. It's it's the hot hit. It's a hot, easy hit from the album. It's getting a lot of airplay overseas anyway. I don't know about here. <laughs> yeah. It's getting played at CKUA. By the way, soon, you know, even with this this album, this album might put it over the top and you'll be number one at CKUA. I would love that. You I've never been number one free. anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I've never been number one anywhere. That'd be great. I'd love that. So, Okay, I'll let you know. Um, place called Love. Yeah. Uh, I, here's a, the conundrum, and I've explained this before. Rather than me imposing what I think songs are about, I try to get out of the way and let the artist, the songwriter who lived it yeah. or imagined it, uh, uh, tell me. But uh, there's a couple of things that uh, place called love. Um, uh, it, it, it's this. Oh man, it sounds like other songs that I've heard, mm -hmm. and yet it's it's its own song. Yeah, well, that I think that's true. It's funny with me because I, that element of familiarity is I try, I kind of strive for that. Almost every song I've ever written, um, I want it to feel like you, it's been around, you know, you know it's weird. And, and it, that's how, that's usually what tells me I'm on the right track. You know, if I'm playing something that, you know, and I don't run away from cliches, I, I go, I run to them. You know, I, I think I just, I don't want to go miles out of my way to say something simple and, and this and that, but um yeah, so so oftentimes I'll be working on a melody, and I think, well, that reminds me of something, but I can never quite put my finger on what it is. Here's and I think that, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> so. Here's a, a question I've never asked before. Thousands of interviews. Yeah. First question: What's your favorite chord? Oh wow! You know, I would have to say I like I like because I use a capo a lot. You know, I go up and down. It's a you know, it's a bit of a cheater really, but I use the capo a lot, and I love playing things in a D position because you can do D in different places up the neck and and it almost sounds like at times like it, you're using like an open tuning or something, you know? So, so what's the best example of it here on the album? Um, let me think. Well, that song is written in a D formation. It, it, I use capo third fret and then play it in a D. Okay, uh, in now you've lost me. I don't have a... Yeah. Well, I, I, hear well, guys, well, I hear you guys talk about guitars and music. <laughs> and it's like yeah. Polish. Yeah, well, it's just like, you know, um, I try when I write a song, I try it in about four or five different keys, right? Just to see which one suits my voice. Sometimes I try it on piano, guitar, because it all changes depending on what, um, you know, yeah, you could, the, you could pick up the tempo or slow it down. But that song, it was the last song I wrote for the album. And um, I don't know, the producer, when he heard it, he thought it was a nice sentiment and he thought that would be a nice way to open up the record you know and because yeah. i think everyone's had such a hard time and that's what that's what the song's about this uh, feeling like after all the struggles over there's hopefully some peace that comes you know uh ron sexsmith um uh, and it, uh, we've come to this point in the interview ron that there's no time for answers only questions okay okay um uh, what i had in mind I, I wrote all around it, observations all around it. It's about loss, I know. You can you can just tell. Yeah. But it's also about legacy because you're, you're reminded of things around you. Those are the flower boxes. No, wait a minute. 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I jumped ahead. What I had in mind is you in school. That's in my school days. Yes. Yes. And not and trying to fit in. Yeah. Yeah. Not trying to fit in, but also just really falling behind and just uh, they didn't know what to do with me. They actually put me back into a slow grade in grade four. Yeah. Um, and then they put me up into a grade five creative writing grade because they they I wasn't paying attention and they knew something was going on in my head and they wanted so they wanted me to see what was would come out you know i ended up i remember writing our classroom christmas play that year you know and all this stuff so i thought that was an interesting thing to do you know um and i think i was sort of borderline osbergers even you know and they but they didn't quite have a word for it then you know were you a happy kid yeah although everyone kept asking me what's the matter because i had a sad face i had a very sad face but but obviously i wasn't happy when i was in school i mean like a lot of kids you know, you're looking out the window and it's a sunny day. And then, you know, then you turn and you're, it's all these facts and figures on the chalkboard. Oh, yeah. Um, so, but I, yeah, I mean, my, I grew up, my, my mom raised me and my brothers. We didn't have a dad until I was nine. Yeah. And, but we had a happy life and we knew we had a lot of kids on our street. So how, how old were you when you realized that music and writing music was a was a, a way out a, a way to find yourself well i think our like really early um like two even or three because um probably more like three because my dad left when i was two and he left his records you know I, we probably talked about this before but um so my mom let me play them there were 45s and uh you know, and I always felt that was a pivotal moment for me because a lot of parents wouldn't let your kid play, you know, yeah. touch the vinyl, you know. And I would just play these songs and there was a lot of doo-wop and Buddy Holly and country and stuff. And I, and, it, and it sounded like, it, I didn't even know what, you know, and I mean, what year they, it didn't matter what year they were from or anything. It just, it made uh, my life feel less lonely, you know, and- and How uh, old were you? Like, like I say, three going on four. Wow. And, and and then and and you got to remember too, uh, this is you know probably sixty seven ish. The songs on the radio at that time were, you know, you're a kid and you hear Nowhere Man on the radio, yeah, and and you're, it blows your mind because you're like, what? It's such a thought provoking concept. Nowhere, he's a real nowhere man, and it's not like where I find there's not a lot of nutrition in in today's pop music. Like I don't hear anybody saying anything, you know, like saying anything that. Like sometimes, themselves. yeah. I mean, when you're a kid, sometimes the song would go over your head because you're a kid. You know, but you just like the words or whatever. But you know, I don't know. It's hard to talk about it without sounding like an old person. But so, but the music I heard on the radio changed my life, and the records that my parents had, I loved. I loved everything. I I, I was. I was at that age where, you know, I would put on Engelbert Humperdinck, you know, and then I, then I would put on a, you know, like a Beatles record or something. It didn't matter to me. I just wanted to hear what people were doing. And uh, Okay. You know. uh, more questions and fewer answers yeah. because you, I'm going to lose you. Okay. Um, asking, uh, Ever Wonder is the yeah. last track on the album. Last tracks are always very special to me. Uh, what is it about that song and why did it choose to be the closer? Well, before I wrote Place Called Love, that was going to be the opening track because oh it was the first song that I wrote for the album. And it's funny because originally I thought it almost had a Beach Boy vibe to it, like wouldn't it be nice or something. But when we got into the studio, it kind of took on this Roger Miller, King of the Road thing with the, you know, clicks and the upright bass. Um, uh, but, you know, I wanted to end, you know, the, the, the last line of the album, the last line of that song goes, how is it kindness can still be seen over the blindness? Uh, ever wonder about that? You know, because I wanted to put people to bed with a sort of a happy thought that there's still kindness out there and there's still people who care. And and so that's why I, I think it makes for a better closing number than an opening. You know, I got my titles confused, Ron. Uh, flower boxes is about loss, but that it's, one is about, about loss. it's about a legacy because you can see what's left behind, right? Yeah. Who was yeah. That oh, you know, he was our. I don't want to, you know, 
diminish his role, but he was like our handyman. You know, when we first moved to Toronto, I mean, sorry, when we first moved to Stratford, we have an old farmhouse. Uh, and we need a handyman. Yeah, and I'm not handy. And and there were things that we wanted. We wanted a fence, and we wanted to turn our attic into a bedroom and stuff. And this guy we met through a friend. We we would just call him, and he'd be over, always very cheerful. You know That's fantastic because you know? we did the same thing. Had the, yeah. exactly the same thing. And the guy that came over to fix everything, yeah. I had met 25 years previously as the executive chef at the Trade and Convention Center in Vancouver. He completely changed his life. Well, I know. And, and the, well, the, the sad thing about it is we had this guy, we felt so lucky to have met this guy. And then he he died unexpectedly, uh, I guess it would have been 2019, just on one of the country roads driving to work. And he had young kids. It was just really sad, uh, you know, and it was really sad for us because he was almost like an angel in a way because he he would just come and he was affordable and he worked fast. And, you know, and my wife um, took would always take pictures of him working and to document the progress on the house and that. Okay. And so what, so after he died, she made a photo album for his wife. And and that's where the song comes from, because Colleen asked me if I could write a little poem in the beginning of the to put at the beginning of the book yeah so i wrote flower boxes um so but it wasn't until like you know a year or so later that i put music to it what was his first name uh jason let's play flower boxes for jason okay uh one more and i'll let you go um maybe um when you walk out on stage in portland tonight uh, and you're a long way from home okay will when you sing when our love was new Will that take you back? Will oh, yeah. Take your friend on the road. It's funny. When I first started to perform that song live, which just was on this recent tour, and I would get choked up singing it, you know. So I finally got past that, I think. But it's a very, that song means a lot to me because, um, you know, we've been, Colleen and I have been together now over 20 years. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had some rough patches and then we're on, we've sort of ended up in this really happy situation and and it, but you know you also are aware of the passing of time you know where it's so it's kind of a wistful song and um but yeah it's a very romantic song too it's almost like uh you know i wrote a song called waste in time on my first album it's you know that's which is like at the beginning of something and this feels more like not the end of something but it feels like you know we we've accumulated all these memories and experiences together and and you know so that's what it's about um, here's your last two, I promise. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah. Do you write to your voice or your heart? Oh, to to my heart, I guess. I, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but um because sometimes I write I'll write a song and I may I, I may not feel like I'm the right person to sing it, you know, I, like even on this record, there's a song called This, That, and the Other Thing, yeah. which I was written for somebody like Smokey Robinson to sing, and I don't have that kind of voice, but I tried. Um, I, love the, I love the riff. Love yeah, it's a, it's a it's a funky song. and um, it's got har I love the harmonies that come in there. And I love yeah, the, yeah. It's light and sunny. It lifts, it lifts your soul. Yeah, yeah I, and that's when I thought that one could be a single, but so far no one at the label has felt that way. But uh, So I, I don't really think about right with my voice in mind, but I, I just... I sometimes I'll write with another singer in mind. Like I've written songs for, you know, I wrote a song for Diana Krall one time, or I wrote some for Bing Crosby actually, who's been dead since the seventies. But sometimes I'll write a song with him in mind, which is crazy. But what's the best? Be. What's the best Ron Sexsmith cover? Cover? Oh wow! You mean that I do live or that I've recorded on a tribute? No, that's album? been recorded. One of your songs has been re-recorded. Oh, 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 I see, I see. I really like Leslie Feist's version of Secret Heart, <laughs> you know, because she's the so only one, so you know, well, she did it in, in in a way that like almost a Euro pop way, like whereas most people like Rod Stewart did it pretty faithfully to my version. Um, she did a kind of when I first heard it, I thought it was Ace of Bass or someone like that. You know, I didn't know who it was. Um, I also really love Emmylou Harris's version of Hard Bargain, which was so unexpected because that just came out of the blue. I didn't know if she was even going to do it. So, Well, well, well. Uh, once again, the wheel turns and you're on the road. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you're carrying your, your, your heart with you on stage in these songs. You're representing all of us. You really are. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and you've carved out a life for Pete's sake. You could have been laying pipe somewhere. You could have been yeah. a rebar, <laughs> you know, you could have been a chef. No, 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 maybe not. No, I couldn't have been a chef. I, mean, I, I probably would still be a courier, I think, is what would have happened, because that's what I was doing before I got signed. And you were, you would have been a great courier. I was a good courier, I must say. Mm -hmm. I really was. Did yeah. you lose any packages? Once. And actually, to bring it back around to Diamond Wave, I wrote that song because I lost a package and I was going to be fired. And on my birthday in January 88, I went down to the office to plead my case and hopefully not lose my job. And they decided to give me a second chance. And just as I was leaving, I said, oh, by the way, it's my birthday today. And, and you know, and then, you know, they were kind of looking at me like, well, lucky, you know, lucky day for you or something. And I went home and I wrote the whole song Diamond Wave um, on my way home on the streetcar and then on the subway and all that. And when I, by the time I got home, I had, had it all finished. So anyway, it's a little uh, serendipity, you know. And then how long, how many years did it take to actually come to light? Uh, well, we recorded it in 2021, so that was, I don't know, do the math. I, I might, I'm so bad at it's math. Great, it's just a great song. Thank you for your time. Thank yeah. you for your life. Uh, I, I hope you come. Or I know you're, I mean, you're close. You're important. Be, you're just down there, but yeah. I'm on Vancouver Island. Get get yourself over. Are you doing any festivals this summer? Good question. I, I Not at the moment, but I keep asking my manager, why don't the festivals ever have me? So I hope to play some, you come know. Come on. Yeah, I know. I should be playing them. I'll, I'll look into it. So, but it's really nice to talk to you. You know, you were my first Zoom, right? Really? Back when the pandemic first started. Really? Yeah. Oh, uh, and I remember not sure if it was going to work or what, you know. So now I'm now it's like old, old hat. But uh, no, you were my first. So, <laughs> um, by the way, did any of these songs get conceived and recorded on uh, Richard Manuel's bench? You know, not conceived or recorded, but. But I use I use his bench to sometimes I'll sit and think about a song I'm working on and to get a little a little further with it. So I'm sure one of these was developed on Richard Manuel's bench. I think, yeah. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Terry. Nice Thank to you, see you. Thank you. Careful. Let's do, let's do it again sometime. So thank you as soon as possible. Right. Thank you. Bye. Take care.